free tickets to a show yesterday on Broadway. There's a reason they were free. <laughs> oh my God. Hi, it's Andrew Klima, hashtag climate change, coming to you from New York City and the Sirhan House, home of the best real estate firm ever. And this is The Anatomy of an Entrepreneur, a podcast where we are going to dissect and explore what it makes and means to have an entrepreneur spirit. And today joining me is Joshua Jahani. Joshua is the head of Jahani and Associates. Yes. It's a pretty good name. Yeah. How did you come up with it? <laughs> uh, a global <laughs> professional services firm with deep connections in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and North America. The firm provides gross services, including investment banking advisory, financial services, and revenue growth services to clients all over the world. Joshua, thank you for joining Good me today. Good to be here. Thank you very much. That's the most intellectual couple sentences I've ever read. <laughs> so help me help me break it down. Actually, before we even get there, I want to tell our listeners today how we first met because yeah. it is a very intriguing story. Yes, it Do you is. recall it? Takelessons.com. Was it that? Takelessons.com. Yeah. Was I taking lessons from you? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> no. That started later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Continues today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So takelessons.com, I was on for vocal coaching. And I think you just sent an inquiry. I was at Deloitte. So I was at Deloitte and we were actually doing some auditing for JP Morgan Chase. Okay. And didn't love the job. It was over in downtown Brooklyn. And I wanted to just, you know, it's my first time living in New York City. I wanted okay. to experience the arts and sort of practice performing the arts. Yeah. And I, so I wanted a, a singing coach. I just, I'd always wanted to sing. Uh, pitch is not great, which you figured out on multiple occasions. And so I figured I could benefit from some training. Yeah. And I wanted a, I wanted a guy because, you know, I wanted to sing a more masculine repertoire. Right. And then I wanted someone that was classically trained. Right. Like, I didn't want to do pop. I didn't, I'm not a right. karaoke guy. Yeah. I have no desire and didn't have a desire then to be a musician. Right. But I just wanted to be able a to- A good thing, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> if there was hope. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I found your profile and you were, you know, your classical chops on right. your profile. Right. And it was super close because you were in Battery Park City. Right. And I, uh, yeah, I, I bought three or four lessons on takelessons.com. Yeah, that was the start. I remember. And I met you and you had gone to Ithaca College. So we had right. the Ithaca overlap. Because you were at Cornell. Yes. Yes. And uh, Go had, Bombers. <laughs> and I had a blast. Met Molly and, you know, the dogs were singing with us when we would hit certain notes. Yeah. And it was a phenomenal. We did that for several years. Yeah, on and off. Yeah, yeah. several yeah. years. And the funny thing is, everybody... You know, Josh is being modest. You, it, when you started out, yeah, it was a little wrangly, but within really short order, you were like better than some of the people I was singing with. There's some like professionally. songs, some songs I can sing well. Yeah. Like Stars. Like I'd right. love to do that one. That was just a great song <laughs> yeah. for me. Some Enchanted Evening in the yes. right pitch level is yes. a great song, but yeah. it's, it's relatively limited. Repertoire. Yeah. Well, that's all right. Yeah, no one's perfect. No, it's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing I love, actually, I'm going to even extend this little portion a little bit longer. The thing about you that I love is, you know, you were singing with me. You were like, all right, yeah, I got this singing thing down. Um, can you teach me how to play the piano? Listen, you're a good teacher. Yeah. Because you're very utilitarian. Okay. So I remember I was like trying to figure out how to do notes. And, you know, you, you read this, you look at all these little lines and these dots on, you have no idea what the hell is going on. Yeah. And uh, you were like, no, Josh, just learn the chords. And you taught right. me the 3-4, the 3-4 three, four. Three, yeah, four yeah. and 4-3 for major minor. Right, I still right. remember it. Okay. And all you have to do is just know the chords. So you right. learn seven chords and then you can get by in any song. And then you taught me, I remember, uh -huh. you do the chord, I think it was at the, the bass side in your left yeah. hand. Okay. And then you do the melody. Yeah. In the right hand. Yes. Voila. So you, you're very like, because I think a lot of teachers would have been like, no, you must follow the classical program. Right. And, and it would have been a waste of time because I'm not seven years old. And, right. But you were just like, no, you want to play a song. Here's right. how you do it. So uh, you right. really- We got that. you there really quickly. Yes. Because yeah. you were focused on just making it what, it what the experience needed to be for the love of music and right. not about the art form or the science behind it, which is more academic. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to, I'll give myself that. Yeah, thank no, you. It's, and yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah. Phantom of the Opera. I remember. Yeah. That was the yeah. first one. No, it's true. But I think the thing that I love about you that's going to translate to this podcast today about entrepreneurship is that you walked in my door as a consultant yes. and you're like, I'm going to learn how to sing. 
And then three months later, in my opinion, you did you had done that, especially at an amateur level, right? right. And you were yeah. then even taking it further, yeah. honestly. And then you're like, hey, um, I'm going to learn how to play piano. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so I teach you how to do this. And then like three months later, you're you're sitting there learning how to play piano. Yeah. Meanwhile, there's still people, you know, that that aren't even close to that level. Yeah. And I actually recall, you know, just talking about your general insanity, that you came in one day. And you're like, uh, I think I want to run a marathon. <laughs> and, you know, if you're watching the podcast today, Josh is Josh is built like a lumberjack. <laughs> you know, he's he's all of, what, short, five, five, ten? No. Five, eight. Yeah, short lumberjack. Yeah. yeah, a short lumber. <laughs> yeah. Very, very lumber. And yeah, I said, well, have you, because you knew I was a runner, yeah, right? Yeah and, yeah, and Molly's a runner. And I said, well, have you ever run? And you said, no. <laughs> but it, he threw it off as if that was... Well, what does that matter? It's a detail. Yeah, it's a small detail. <laughs> it I've never matter. run. I'm going to run a marathon. And then this gentleman proceeded to, you know, carve out a plan and ran a marathon within six months. I still haven't run a marathon. Well, got to focus. <laughs> but so that 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 is going to really come through today in in this podcast. Yeah, like probably. that is the mindset that is necessary. But anyway, um, I I do want to quickly end with the fact that. That recently you bought an apartment in the city. Tell I me did. about that. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> as everybody knows, yeah. uh, my good friend Andy Klima is yes. a real estate executive, real estate wow. professional. Yeah. yeah. Hashtag climate change. <laughs> and um, we bought a. Is, do you call it luxury condo? Is it luxury? I think it's luxurious. It's you know on its way to luxury, and I oh. feel like luxury has a wide range of Very. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> interpretations. And uh, we wanted to buy a condo for a variety of personal and business reasons. Right. And so we really liked the idea of central Harlem, yeah. somewhere in the Harlem zone. And uh, we closed on it in March. We did not see it. And Kalima ran the, the whole thing. And uh, i really very grateful. It's, it's very genuine gratefulness because I, I was convinced you were going to do a better job than me. And if I got involved, I was probably just going to mess it up. And so, yeah, we closed. Wimpley the fifth. <laughs> we closed and <laughs> yeah. love the apartment. Beautiful space. Beautiful building. It really is nice. Yeah. Great people running the place. Yeah. So. Yeah. So just to say that if this man who is, I'm going to go, I'm going to say that you're particular. I'm not going to say okay. controlling. I'm nope. just going to say particular. Okay, I'll, take, I'll take particular. And yeah. You know, he trusted me to to buy this apartment for him without ever seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. Hundreds yeah. of thousands. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there, everybody. If you're, if you're thinking about a real estate agent, maybe, <laughs> maybe give me a call. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, this isn't about me. This is about you and Jahani Associates. Tell me what, because I read the blurb, right? But yes. To me, you know, before we came on today, you and I were agreeing that we're we're both smart individuals, but we're not very smart. <laughs> we're we're smart enough. Yeah. So dissect this for me because it was a lot of big words. Yeah. What sure. does J and A do? So it's a professional services firm. We have clients. Clients hire us to grow, and the way okay. we define growth is through investment banking. Okay. So if that includes capital placement, mergers and acquisitions, we can do that. We have a, a outsourced broker dealer. We used to do some of our securities work today, and then it's consulting around that. Okay. And then we have revenue growth, which we define as just increasing sales in our select markets, which I'll go into in 20, 10 seconds. Okay. And then the third is more broad financial services, is growth-oriented companies have to have a different financial model and financial understanding of their business than, say, like a coffee shop. Okay. If you own a coffee shop and you want to have that coffee shop and just use it as an annuity to run your life, it's a different financial perspective than if you want to own a technology company or even a coffee shop that you want to franchise and blow up into a huge, huge success. Sure. So what's most unique about the firm is that we focus on these regions that not very many people focus on. Okay. So I'm a New York guy. We're based in New York City. The firm is. And... Uh, we focus on helping companies across the world expand into the Middle East, North Africa. Okay. Southeast Asia. Okay. And Latin America. How did you land on these, these areas? Yeah. And why aren't more people doing it? Well, it's hard. Okay, uh, good. It's hard. <laughs> that's reason number one. It's interesting when you look at... So if you look at capital markets and you look at the world... Okay. The vast majority of money in investment, investment into companies, the vast, vast majority of money is in the USA okay. and Europe. All right. Think stock exchanges, right? New right. York Stock Exchange will you know, run trades larger than the GDP of so many countries in the world. 
Um, and so the big players were relatively small business today, but the big players like, you know, pick Molis or Goldman or whoever, they are focused on doing work and providing advice driven by the fees of these large sure. investment sizes. Yeah. Um, and they're they're very good at it. Right. right? It'd be very, it's very difficult to compete with them, even for them to compete with each other. It's challenging. So as a right. small company carving out a niche, our focus was let's find regions that want commercial activity that is happening in the U.S. and that have these unique commercial opportunities okay. that are different than Europe and in the U.S. because it's not as competitive. Interesting. Yeah. And there's really interesting, I'll talk more about it, and, okay. you know, guide me on how much detail you want to spend. But when you look at like, look at Middle East, North Africa. Okay. There were 550 million people. Can you give me a couple like countries just in case I'm sure. not? Sure. Yeah. You know, we're American. I think we can agree <laughs> our geography is not great, right? <laughs> Give me a couple. Give me a couple countries in case I'm sitting there listening, going, "Yeah, Northeast Africa. <laughs> what is that?" So, Middle East, North Africa yeah. is Egypt, yeah, and it goes over to Morocco. So, okay. if you imagine Africa, yes. right, just sort of a rainbow across Africa. Okay, and then the Middle East part yes. is largely the Arab nations of Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Jordan, etc. And these these uh, countries where you have connections, what are the what are the investors doing that that they have their capital? Like, how do they gain their capital? Primarily, oil, oil. Yeah. So when you so if you look at Middle East, North Africa, five hundred and fifty million people. I don't have the GDP of Mina memorized, but it, when you look at the wealth in Mina, the vast majority of it is in a subsection of Mina called the GCC. The GCC stands for the Gulf Cooperation Council. Okay, it's an association of Arab nations that um, that I just listed: uh, Qatar, yeah. Kuwait, Oman, KSA, which is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. And their wealth is primarily driven by oil. Sure. Saudi, okay. Saudi Arabia has the se second largest oil reserves in the world, next to Venezuela. The GDP of Saudi Arabia is around $900 billion. 60% of that is in oil. Wow. And it's a cash business. Okay. So there's all this cash that is being generated by the natural resources of the region. And that gives opportunity for select deals. The vast right. majority of that money still finds its way into the USA and into Europe. But the UAE, because of its wealth and because of the fact that it's connected to 550 million people, sure. can be a very logical place for a small or medium-sized company in the U.S. to do business Interesting. if the business overlaps. So right. not Medicare right. technology, that would be bad because it doesn't make any sense, but right. e-commerce, fashion, textiles, consumer products, right. food and beverage. They, it is a very logical place to be. And there's some other macroeconomic forces at play, particularly since COVID. Interesting. So, so with COVID and the pandemic, Europe just, I mean, just got smashed. Like Spain, I think one of the, I, I don't want to misrepresent, but one of the major countries had a negative GDP. Right. They couldn't, there was, everyone was masking and locking down or whatever, and they were able to handle it better. Yeah. In the GCC. Okay. And then particularly as tensions have grown it, before the Ukrainian invasion, but sure. you have the Chinese and tension with the US, Europe, can, uh, excuse me, the Middle East can become uh, the new Europe. Interesting. A middle ground between these, because China's gigantic. Right. And now with Russia and China playing in the sandbox together, hmm. the geopolitical importance of the Middle East, North Africa just goes up and up and up every single day. Well, good thing you you already have a foothold there. <laughs> that was smart. Yeah. That's good and, hindsight. And it was more of a pull. It was more of a pull than a push is that we would go there to do business and yeah. there were people who wanted to do business with us. Yeah. And so well, that's miraculous. I mean, look at you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. First time. It was yeah. the first time. <laughs> first time you ever had success. All right. So, and also you said uh, South America. So Latin America, Southeast Asia. Sorry. So, so Southeast Asia is a similar dynamic. Okay. You have big economies like Indonesia. Yeah. Indonesia got its independence from the the Dutch, I believe, in the 40s. Yeah. And then had some issues with like this king or this uh, prime minister that was- Who you know, hasn't? You know, you know we've well, all been there. Everybody at this yeah. point. And he was, was in power for too many terms, then they yeah. removed him. And so really only around 2000 did the country really start to boom. Huh. Uh, Indonesia has a GDP of $1 trillion, right around a wow. trillion dollars. And uh, very diversified, stable currency, massive producer of uh, palm oil, you know, oh. which is used in everything, okay. all kinds of you know home products. Um, Singapore, 
yeah. the very like a uh, like no corruption in Singapore, right. uh, massively wealthy from trade okay. because Singapore's where all the goods from China right. and India and Southeast Asia flow through. Wow. And so it's a similar dynamic. Philippines is a little more chaotic because you've got so many islands and it has a pretty robust BPO industry. Like there's a lot of labor. Okay. Uh, but just really interesting markets for U.S. companies to attack and, yeah. and benefit along with the the people in the country. So, how do you connect them at JNA? Okay, I'm a I'm a medium sized business. Yep. Which, by the way, I think this is brilliant. So you 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 carved out a niche. Yes. Or, or you or you found you didn't find the niche, but you saw it there, and you saw it being underserviced, and you said, "I want to service that that yes. area." And so you said, "Let me connect these business owners with these people with money." Right. Yes. More or less. Yes. I'm really boiling it down. That's here. a simplified version. Yes. Yes. Um, how did you come up with that? Where, how did you think to do that? We were we were doing business in the UAE because uh, we had some clients that were in blockchain technology, and the okay. UAE was an early blockchain adopter. Okay. And uh, there was just like I said, it was a pull. Like people want it. Huh. And think about the think about the Middle East, North Africa, and Southeast Asia is less like this, but Middle East, North Africa has really been booming since the last 20, 30 years. Okay. And all of the largest tech companies, would you would you like to guess who are the largest companies in the world? Please I, don't put me on the spot. I gave you the answer. Okay. Apple, Google, <laughs> like look at the last 30 years, right? It's Microsoft, Apple, Google, yes. all this kind of stuff. Yes. But those are not in MENA. Okay. There, there's, right. and so as a leader, as a king, they have kings in the, in the GCC, you need to be able to capture this innovation. Right. And you have to, you have to pull it in. And the U.S. is a very innovative country. Like we still do very well. It's competitive with China, et cetera, but Americans are innovators. Latin America, similar dynamic. Latin America has a weaker uh, governments, a yeah. lot of problems with government in uh, so many Latin American countries that the UAE or Singapore doesn't have. But it has this, there's this bleeding of Latin American culture into the U.S. and Canada. Yeah. And so if you are a U.S. company that has a USP, a unique selling proposition to a Latino or a mm -hmm. South American buyer, right? you should capitalize on that market in agriculture, technology, fat, I mean, not fashion, entertainment. Sure. Come on. Like, I mean, the, the Latino market for entertainment is rapidly becoming more lucrative than some of the more classic markets. Yeah. yeah. All right. So that's Jane in, in a nutshell. Yes. And now I want to, I'm glad that we, we explained what you do, but more focused here is about how you got there, what you do as a business owner day to day, how to grow your company, et cetera. That's what I'm most interested in. Not that I'm not interested in sure. everything you just said. That's fine. But you know, a couple of times, if you were watching my eyes might have glazed <laughs> yeah, over. Yeah, it's, it's very esoteric, you know? right? I mean, yeah. It's not every day you're like, okay, what's the GDP of Indonesia? Yeah. But, but see, this is why I'm friends with you. Because I, if I had that thought, I would just text you and ask you. I wouldn't even look on Google. I would just text Jahani. Yeah. So talk to me about the entrepreneurship aspect. You you literally grew this from nothing. That is true. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that is true. Which I find the most impressive. In fact, there are there are two people in the world, and I won't reveal the other person's name, but you are one of them that I said to Molly, if this gentleman ever needs money in for an investment, I will give it to him <laughs> because he will take it and he will make us a billion dollars. <laughs> well, and I think that that, you know, we already touched upon, you know, some of your intrinsic um characteristics. Yes. I think I was gonna say habits, but it's really it's really characteristics of you that take you there. So let's start there actually. Like how, what are the things in your opinion that make you a successful entrepreneur? Um, I think the repetition, th think about big companies, Okay, right? So think Nike or insurance companies, whatever. They do the same thing over and over and over. And they're relatively simple. And when you're on a road to trying to build something that can be large, because large companies are almost always very specific and they do the same thing. Okay. There's not very many large companies that do a little bit of everything. Right. So they found a niche and they found a niche that's large enough where they can make money and dominate the category. So it's, it can be a bit mind numbing. Same thing. Interesting. The story I just gave you, hopefully it sounded engaging, but how many times do you think I've said all of that? A lot. A lot. Yeah. A lot. And you have to say it in a way that doesn't, 
sound like it's the thousandth time you've said it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the the most like boring parts, if I'm just being honest. Yeah. Is that so you you're building something, you found something that kind of works, and then there's this repetitive it measured in years. Like I mean Thank it, you for saying that right off the bat. Keep going. Okay. Like it will be I will tell that story again. The numbers will change a little. But in decades, I, if we are able to become a large company, I will be saying the same thing. Right. And I think people, you have to have, that's where there's a grit and tenacity and all this nonsense. It's like just doing the same damn thing every day. Like if you want to be fit, running and eating broccoli every day. Right. And people don't think about that. It, and it's it's hard to find what's that repetitive sales script or that repetitive action that you can monetize to make more money than you spend doing it. Interesting. Yes. And so you have to, when you see it, this is, I used to tell someone, I don't double, when I find success, when I find something that's working, I don't, I don't double down. Okay. I quadruple down. Yeah. And you certainly do. (laughs) Because you have to, because most things don't work. So when you find something that a client or a customer finds valuable and and has value associated with the money that you're charging, you have to be able to see it, which sometimes you miss it. But then when you do see it, you have to quadruple down and you have to repeat it over and over and over. Oh, there are so many gems in this little (laughs) teeny section of the last two minutes. I think I I would like to start with the quadruple down. Okay. Right? Like how, and I think that you and I were talking about this a little bit before we started today. The difference between you and I, give that RPM example. I really liked that. Well, I was saying, like, I think you also have to be a bit lucky. So genetic. Oh, extremely. But yeah. but like genetically. Yes. Because looking back, right, I'm in my 30s um, and I, I'm seeing, and we're still very small, so we'll see what happens. I have, I uh, definitely have ambitions. Yes. But- I see. Also, please don't sell yourself short. You're doing an amazing job. Thank right? you. JNA is is really exploding. When you take something from zero to numbers that we won't disclose that are right. big, yeah, that's pretty impressive. All right, thank you. Okay, all right, all right. So I'll I accept. Yes, massive. Um, <laughs> the um, the genetics. So yes. there really is a unique gene pool. In a uh, not overthinking things. I think. Smart, not being, smart enough. Yeah, you have to be smart, but right. you don't want to be like, I think people that are truly brilliant geniuses can struggle with like parts of the repetition or the failure rate of trying to, you know, carve out these successful offerings. Right. Um, so that was one joke we were making. But seriously, yeah. is yeah. that you want to be smart, but not too smart. And But the, I think that, let's stop there for a second. I think that's very true, right? You have to, you have to identify like a problem that you need to solve. Or in my case, okay, I identified that, you know, Battery Park City was being underserved. There wasn't a dominant agent. Yep. And then I moved there and I said, well, why don't I just take over? Right. Okay. That wasn't that huge of an idea, but I had to kind of right. figure it out. Yeah. Right. So, okay. St- okay. Continue. I, I agree. I think that's yeah. a great example. Um, and then also having energy you know, physical energy, it is a mm. kinetic, I always say this to my coworkers, is that it's kinetic, which is a physics term for the energy of a moving thing. Right. So it's it's motion. And yes. kinetic, the thing, when you study physics, that if you want to make, if you want to create kinetic energy, you have to apply force. You have to apply energy to it. Things don't just hang out like with kinetic energy. Right. So you have to take energy from one space and put it into something else, which means you have to have more energy. And so the conversation we were having around yes. RPMs is that we just idle high. Yes. Like if you look at a sports car, not <laughs> not trying to say we're some amazing red sports car that's a convertible. Maybe you. I, more I don't like know that. if I'd go red, but all right, continue. <laughs> I, I see where you're headed here. Is that, you know, you idle at like a, like a higher RPM, whereas maybe most people just genetically idle at a lower RPM. Right. So the, and we have energy. Yeah. And you have to. Right. You really have to. And I think that the a couple other important things that you said in that two minute blurb that was brilliant in my opinion was that the repetition. Yeah. Okay. You identify something and now you have to repeat it and repeat it. And you know, earlier in the podcast series, I was talking to a um an owner of an orange theory. Yeah. Um, he owns several orange theories and he coaches, he just crossed 7,000 classes. And he was saying that sales for him is that person that walks in on class 6,999 has to feel like it's class number one. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. So like that energy that you bring to the pitch yeah, and that repetition, it has to just keep 
being like the first time you're a performer. Yeah. It's the first time you're saying it to this group of people and you have to convince them that you're as interested as you are on your best day as the day that you're, you know, a little hungover or whatever. Yep. You have to bring that same energy. And I think that the other thing that entrepreneurs are successful at is failing. Yeah. So talk about you set you kind of glazed over oh and the failure rate. Yeah. Uh, defi- talk to me about how you've failed or how you've overcome those failures yeah. during your career. I have a question for you. Yeah, okay. This is sort Great. of like a, a mind, just like a mental game. Okay. Um, there's no wrong answer. If Thank you, you for setting it up that way. <laughs> <laughs> really took the pressure off What of is me. the square root of 70? 70- <laughs> uh, <laughs> how many, if you make 100 decisions in a day, yeah. how many of those decisions do you think are either A, wrong, or B, not in the top five of best decisions possible? Wow, that's what a pretty heady. Um, and what's the square root of 72? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to answer the first question only. Okay. And I'm going to say maybe like 30%. Okay. Yeah. I think entrepreneurs always give higher numbers. I'll ask people I work with, 5%. Really? Someone, someone said they, they're right or in the top five of best decisions 95% of the time. I made, I hung up the phone. <laughs> so I think like <laughs> the, the failure rate is – Like a a way to look at it. But when I think about my life, particularly running a business and trying to build a business, I'm making decisions ad nauseum. I mean, just just like constantly. And my decisions have dollar amounts attached to them. As, As we've gotten larger, the dollar amounts go up. So the risk gets higher each time. And the number of times I think I make a decision that is either wrong or not in the top five is close to 50%. Right. And the only way that I can survive, because if I have 100 decisions I'm going to make for the year, I make all of them on January 1st, 50 of them are wrong, Yeah. then I will go out of business by February. Right. So what I have to do is I have to make 100 decisions on January 1st, rapidly identify the 50 decisions that are not in the top five of the best, remake those decisions on 4 a.m. January the 2nd, identify the 50% of those, Right. and then something out exactly. All the way along. And so it's it's this it's not a failure so much as it is just constantly having to reiterate and double quadruple down or remove in some categories. Okay, interesting. But I think also it is accepting the failure that comes with, you know, doing a pitch and not getting it or speaking to a client and that client's no good or, or whatever that is for your business. I think that you're very good at moving on to the next yeah. lead. Yeah. Accepting your decision was wrong can be restated as accepting the failure. Depends on just how you're looking at it. I don't, I think the failure, it's fine. Like, yes, entrepreneurs have to do a lot of stuff and fail repeatedly. Right. But I think it's more about we're wrong constantly. Because we're also in zones, the most successful entrepreneurs. I mean, think about building like Google or what's going on with Tesla. Think about sure. like, no one's doing this. Right. So who the hell knows what the right answer is? Yes. And yeah. that I think about that a lot, and particularly as we've gotten larger, knowing this is like more of a, like an emotional element is knowing when you really are the wrong guy to make a decision. Mm. Because there are categories of decisions that you can outsource to your employees who are qualified to make them that can spend, you know, they don't need to make a 500 decisions a second. Right. And then their failure rate is maybe 5%. That's the guy that I was talking to is actually- right. Like, and he, he might be right because he sits, he thinks, he tests a little before investing. Interesting. Yeah. Whereas you and I, I think you and I have joked about this even maybe in singing lessons, we're fire ready aim. <laughs> yeah. There's, and we've fire. already shot and then we're like, where are we supposed to aim? <laughs> but I think that that's what has led to our success. Right. And then like you're saying further, let me, let me break it down maybe in a different terminology. You delegate to someone within your firm structure that maybe can can has a unique skill set that's going to make a better decision in that category. Yeah. But you've identified, okay, this is an area that I'm not so great or that I don't want to take the time to think about. You do it. There's also, if you think about neurology, and I'm not trying to be like super esoteric with all of this. This is just how I think about it. I studied okay. science and engineering. And so you think about it's if you receive a reward, you do an action, you wake up every morning, you do 10 jumping jacks, you lose a pound, people compliment you at the gym, that's your reward. Action, reward, action, reward. That's where animals, that's how humans uh, behave. 
So if you do actions and then your business grows, which you receive as the reward, because mm -hmm. assuming the entrepreneur wants to grow their business, yes, then it can be a damning series of events when you start relying on the neurological pathways that led to those decisions over and over. What I'm trying to say is that the decisions I made and what I did six months ago are now no longer the right decisions. I either have to delegate it or I have to figure out a new kind of process because things change so fast. So back to the failure rate, yes. is that not you don't even get presented with the same 500 decision set every week. No. It's a totally different set. And each of those decision sets point down, they're like subsets of the sets you were dealing with before. Okay. And then you just you go to sleep. You can't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that must have been that must have been really hitting the nail on the head with whatever you just said, because a light appeared on <laughs> I, as if I God himself <laughs> came down or herself, you know, and said, Ding, Validation. this is it. Yeah. This is it, Josh. Validation. So if you didn't catch that uh watching on YouTube, go back, please. Because this <laughs> this clearly was the best thing you said. I obviously it was divine, Science. divinely yeah. affirmed. Yes. Yes. Um in that in that little sentence you just gave me, um, I thought about how, in my opinion, you've really mastered hiring and firing. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you talk to me about that? Because I think this is important, right? As an entrepreneur grows their business, you take on people. Yep. One thing I struggle with is, is when I understand, oh, and, and, and God has me. said, this is not a good topic, <laughs> but sorry, I'm going to continue with All it. Right. <laughs> um, you know, I, I bring someone on and maybe they're not the right fit and I don't know what to do. I struggle with retaining them or or firing them or hiring them. How do I do this? You, I think you've really figured this out. Can you talk to me about employees? Uh, yeah, specifically on hiring and firing employees. Well, whatever. I just think that you've you've really expanded through employees. How many employees do you have right now? We have, I don't know, 150, 180. A lot of them are based outside of the US. Yeah, but and, you again, you throw this stuff off. That's a lot of people to manage. It, it, yeah, well, and I don't manage most of them. Okay, I think fair. That I, I actually, just being very honest, yeah. I, I started- Please lie to me. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm so you're so handsome. <laughs> oh, uh, ouch! <laughs> joking. Okay. Uh, that's a joke. Um, I burn people out. Hmm. I think that's typical. All founders, right? Successful founders, CEOs, etc. I burn them out, and I noticed this summer of last year is that the people working with me were burning out, and then they were. I was not. It's it's their fault. They would fail to meet performance requirements and things. But looking back on it, it's like. I probably was, I think that person was just struggling with the workload in general. Interesting. And so one of the things is that getting to the, where we are now, yes, hire, hire slowly, fire fast. That's like a, a, a trite statement people make. Sure. So we do do that, hire slowly, fire fast. But I think another thing is knowing when you should even work with someone and being able to create processes around it, which mm. sounds kind of obvious, but is, is hard to implement. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, trying to do stuff KPI driven as much as possible. Okay, okay. Yeah. Where do you struggle with your business? He didn't, he didn't anticipate this question, yeah, apparently. That was a big yeah. sigh. Yeah. Good, give me, give, me, give me something. What do you have trouble with? We are almost always yes. intermediaries. Okay. So if you think about professional services, consulting, investment banking, yes, um, they're very different categories. So if you hire a consultant to build a website, you want the website to be purple, you want there to be a dancing frog on top of the website, whatever it is, yeah, it is really just a function of that consultant's uh, determination to get that job done. There's nothing that will stop them from doing that. Okay. One of the areas that we struggle with or that we find challenging as intermediaries in our business is that we are representing people and trying to get other people to do something, whether it's partner with a client, whether okay. it's review some kind of investment or merger and acquisition offering. That's challenging. It's very challenging. And so being able to articulate and set expectations with the people that we work with, mm. uh, you have to be uh, very honest and very transparent and also make sure that you're uh, creating the most uh, likelihood scenario for success okay. for your clients and for your own business. And that is very hard about this industry. 
It's so, okay. I I too am a broker. Yeah. Right. You yeah. you basically just define broker the, the yeah. middleman. Yep. As I have gained more years in this industry, I find that over communication is the way to succeed there. Yeah. Do you yes. agree? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's it's over communication, setting expectations, being very transparent. Yes. I love that. So I have a hundred, I think 38 right now, five-star reviews on Zillow of which you, you are not one of the five stars. <laughs> hint, hint. Maybe you could get that review up soon. I'll do it. <laughs> um, but what I love is that consistently when I read them and I, you know, I don't, you know, I don't pay people to do this or anything. I just ask them after the closing, would you please do this? It helps my business. They say something to the effect of, Working with uh, hashtag climate change, Andy Klima, he is almost sometimes too honest. He is brutally honest, but you know what? It actually served me better yeah. in the long run because, you know, what I always tell the sellers, like when we're in that room and they're asking me, what is my apartment worth? And I tell them, you know, it's actually worth a million dollars. And they say, well, I think it's worth one, two. I said, well, don't worry. If we price it at one, one or one, two, I'm going to try to convince that other person that it is worth that. But when we're sitting here in this room with no recording devices on, I want to be honest with you about what I actually think the value of this apartment is. Right. The data-driven number. So that in three months, if I just over-promised and said to you, yeah, I think it's worth one too. Yeah. But really, I knew all along it wasn't. And then in three months, you come to me and say, hey, Andy, what the hell? Yeah. Why aren't you selling this? Yeah. I just want us to be on the same page right here that I think non-emotionally, because I don't live in this apartment, I have no connection to it. Like a, my child didn't grow up right there and take its first steps, right? Right. Um, this is what it's worth. Yeah. If we want to choose to market in some different way, fine. And then during the sales process, I am just like communicating with them. Here's what happened at the open houses. Here's the statistics on the market during the week. Yep. All these sort of things so that they know that something is happening. And I think my clients know too that, if they feel like I haven't given them that information, they can reach out and and get that information from me. So what I heard you say basically is communication. Yeah. Well, it's interesting is listening to your answer and thinking about the conversation we had around uh, decision matrices or <laughs> yeah. that where we were earlier. Yeah. Is that what what I like about thinking about things abstractly is that it's relatable. Yeah. So you are dealing with the same decision algorithm that I'm dealing with. There's maybe a different color to it, but sure. it's the same decision. And so are your clients. And so are my clients. Right. Because my clients are businesses. And mm. even your clients, you own a one, $2 million apartment. That's like a real asset. Yes. And so when you think about decisions, the one of the l hard pieces about that is that you don't have access to all the information. So if you have right. a partner and you're paying this person money right. to give you as much information as possible so that you can go from that 50 or 30% down to the five, that's worth a lot. And I think the thing that we forget as business owners and entrepreneurs is that we know, okay, I'm assuming we're successful. So assuming you're a successful entrepreneur who has the knowledge base, yep. I know that I know what I'm talking about. Yes. And I assume that you know that I know what I'm talking about sometimes because we're busy, yes. right? We're, we're running successful businesses. And we forget to maybe take that extra five minutes to write the very specific email with links to other whatever, yes. you know, to say, here's why I know that I'm right about this. And here's how you can see it too, right? So I think that, and, and in running my team, one thing I've found as a struggle is that even though the you know the generation that that is on my team is a much more communicative generation with their phone yeah. in terms of Instagram or whatever they're doing on right. their phone during the meeting when they're not looking at me, which drives me nuts, <laughs> right? Is that they don't actually communicate in business? Yeah, which is mind boggling to me. Yeah, they they over communicate in some ways personally, yep. but don't communicate in business. And I think that we we really have to marry those two like i'm speak i'm like putting up a mirror to my own you know team right yeah, now absolutely but i think that that's what i heard you say too what's well, conflict Commun yeah so it's it's communication you're right but it's not saying oh my god I, I got you a coffee how's your morning doesn't the sun look nice every right. day that's not what it is no it's communicating and being able to literally create conflict that is yes. professional because as a broker, it's unique, right? Yes. The, the IT consultant with the pink frog dancing on the purple website is yes. different yes. than a broker who is dealing with external forces they cannot control and things do not go according to plan. Yes. And so 
it, this is interesting. Sometimes some of my teammates say to me, well, there's nothing to communicate. Nothing happened. That's... And I said, well, that's what you communicate then. Because, because then in a month when they have three weeks in a row of, hey, nothing's been happening. And then you say, hey, I think we got to do a price adjustment in my business or right. in your business, whatever the, the equivalent is. Yeah. Now that person understands, okay, I exactly. think I think I need to make that decision now because this here's what I've been given yeah. during this time. Yeah. So it's very interesting. It is to me. It is the the entrepreneurship that could be an interesting topic is just entrepreneurship in intermediary industries. Maybe we'll do the next one just for that. Yes, I'll but have you back. Platforms and stuff that yeah. would be interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, what is one thing? Because I asked you, this all sort of started with what do you struggle with? Yep. What's one thing that you have executed over the years that has yielded, in your opinion, one of the biggest payoffs? And like, what was it? Like, what is something you did that you really are like, man, I knocked that out of the park. You know, for me, for instance, it was identifying that Battery Park City was underserved and then to your, to use your phrase, quadrupling down. Yeah. And just, and by the way, doing it consistently for over a decade. Yeah, I'm, I, that's it. You just gave it is the, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Latin America. So if you are a business owner and a lot of these people are Latinos or, you know, from Arab descent or et cetera. Yeah. And you want access to these markets, working with us it is always the most resource efficient way to do it. It costs two grand if you fly coach just to fly to Dubai. Yes. And so being able to, A, communicate that value, but really create value in that cross-border transaction category, which is where we specialize, uh, that is working very well. Creating value. Yeah. 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 And, and I think knowing, this is something I was just talking yesterday about to a team member, creating value, no, having something to tell people. In New York City, you know, we were joking, this, this team member's from a different uh, market previously. And they were saying to me, hey, in these, in these other markets, people used to just want to work with me because I was a nice guy. Mm. And I said, yeah, the, the problem with New York City people <laughs> is that they assume they know more than you about everything, yeah. including your industry. Yeah. So, so you, you know, what I found to be my like USP maybe, you know, is that I'm very nice, but then I have all these, or at least three, I, I start to say all these things in my pocket, but even if I'm unfamiliar with a certain subsect of a market, at least three points that I know that they don't know what they're like, I know that I know something they don't know so that I can then create value when they come in to the apartment and say, well, did you know that this is happening? Did you know that this is happening? Did you know that this is happening? And now all of a sudden they want to work with me because I provided them some sort of value mm. that they previously didn't know. I, I would articulate that as, as really having a genuine dominance of a subject matter. Okay. Like, I think I agree with what you said as well, but I think in terms of the entrepreneurship and sort of like what, what this podcast is really about is, yes. is actually knowing, right? Like, cause you read a hundred books and right. you did it for 10 years and you got a, a degree or whatever, if a degree yeah. is relevant. Yeah. So I think that, and people probably don't think about that as much. Maybe they, they think about networking more, which is important. Things like that. Oh, like yeah. Networking is important. But like genuinely knowing your stuff is hard. And it isn't. If you love it. But yeah, I, you know, you, said, you we, we were also kind of talking about this offline before today about, you know, people don't do certain things because it, it's hard. But, you know, in that example, to pick up a book or to go on Google now and to research that thing is not that difficult. I mean, you're a gentleman that's up at like, I don't know, what, 4 a.m. every day? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, a lot Sometimes, of days. Yeah. Many more. He Joshua is up many more days at 4 a.m. than I am up at 4 a.m. Well, that's yes. what I shall tell you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, won't, we won't talk about how many because it's basically all. But, you know, if you have the tenacity, the information is there. You can, you can put this true. together. Yeah, not not having not making excuses. It kind of depends on what you want, right? Like a, that's true. A lot of people say they want to be an entrepreneur, but they're not willing to do the work. Right. And it's just the bottom line. But they haven't realized it yet. They'll realize it later. But uh, <laughs> that's an, that's how I would articulate what you're saying is that. And we're fortunate to live in that time. I mean, think a hundred years ago, if you really wanted to work in finance and you lived in Brazil, it was you know challenging. It right. Just, Right. We have the, we have the options afforded to us now. Yeah. And so it, because it's also a high, 
I don't know, popularity field right now. Everybody thinks they want to do it. Yeah. And it's easy and whatever. And then you you pull back the curtain and you realize, well, no, it's not really. I remember when I was at Deloitte. Okay. I would talk to the partners, right? Partners that make a ton of money. They own units, they have all these dividends. And I remember asking them, this is very honest. I'm going to just be very honest. I love it. And uh, I remember why there was a guy who like one, was going to be partner and then didn't do it. And I said, why? Why didn't you become partner, Brian or something? And he says, it was a bit like golden handcuffs. Is that, yes, I was partner and I had all this uh, power and all this money, but it felt a bit like golden handcuffs. And I, I think about that sometimes huh. uh, because as an owner, because there's entrepreneur, there's owner, there's financial executive, there's real estate executive. But as an owner, sometimes you really are just building a gilded cage for you to sit in. Yes. People come in and out of the cage, but you're always there. Wow. <laughs> and I'm going to end there because there's nowhere to go from it. But I think you're right, yeah. uh, by the way. Yeah. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs that have that have reached some pinnacle of success are sitting out there right now, maybe tearing up a little like I just started to <laughs> because you're right. Yeah. Right. We created this monster and and it's a beautiful monster. Yes. But we are we're stuck with it now. Yeah. Uh, I may or may not have said that in the past in my living room to my wife. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you're right. So before we end today, I'd like to ask everybody the same five questions just to kind of get some new information for myself. What is right. your favorite New York City restaurant? Oh, my goodness. Aquavit over, if it's still open, on like 57th Street in, 7th, in uh, Lexington. What do you like to get there? Uh, we do the prefix. We used to go pre-pandemic. My wife and I would go. It's this really nice, um, nice, you know, uh, restaurant. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you have a we, New York City? Yeah, you want to see what I'm about to ask you? <laughs> uh, New York City secret spot or go to? Like, let's say you're, let's say somebody came into town and you were, they were visiting. They never been here. You take them here because you feel like it's unique and different. Uh, Club Macanudo with the cigars and Rain's Law Room for the drinks. Wow. Thank you for never taking me to either of those. <laughs> well, you're a New Yorker. You said yeah, if I someone comes in. I didn't know those two things. Well, I, I mean, did. you know I wouldn't smoke a cigar because, you know, the 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 former moneymaker. The you know, delicate, yeah. And delicate flower vocal <laughs> folds. Uh, but I would like the drink next okay. time you're in town. Yes. Okay, deal. deal. Um, what would you tell yourself if I had a camera here? It, you're, it's three or five years ago, or you're, you're speaking to three or five years ago, Joshua Jahani. What would you say? Trust yourself. Yeah. Trust yourself. Uh, I remember remember Game of Thrones when Daenerys yes. Sno Stormborn, she's giving a speech and she says, there's something special about me. My dreams come true. Huh. I was like, I liked that quote. And I think about that sometimes is that if you really stick with it and you make sure that you're honest and that you, you know, really are, are judging and being critical, you just trust yourself. By the way, I think that that is 100% the same answer that everyone gives. Yeah. 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 What's the best money management thing you do personally? I would buy real estate, honestly. I think with interest rates high. I did not ask him to say that. Yeah. Right? It depends on the volume of money. So if you have like 500 grand to $5 million, right. real estate is often the best place for that kind of money. Or sure. you put it in an index fund, whatever. Warren Buffett wrote a book about how the amateur investor should just buy index fund uh, shares. Sure. But real estate is really good. Even though interest rates are high, yeah. but that should bring the prices down. Ideally, right. you would know more about that than me. Right. And you can refinance when yeah. that looks like they're going to go down again. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. From from a very knowledgeable finance guy. So yeah. listen to him. Uh, hashtag climate change. And what is your favorite <laughs> book? I'm currently reading Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. The way. I'm not going to say the name right. By by Tao Te Chong. Yeah. 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 The yeah. way. That's a really good one. It's very interesting. I didn't realize that you were in that space. The way. Well, just the uh, meditative space. No, but this is Marcus Aurelius meditations. So yes. this is the emperor. So this uh, is not. But I'm like, just saying like even no. the, the the reflective thought reflective you space. You didn't think I was reflective? Well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Joshua, if if someone's out there listening and they're thinking, you know what, I own a medium-sized business and I would like to connect with the GCC. Yeah. How do We're, they get in touch with you? It's very easy to find us. Just yeah. Google us or go to our website or we'll find you. <laughs> <laughs> Jahani and Associates. Yes. Yeah. And we'll make sure we link that in the bio. Hey, thanks for coming today. It's always good to see you. Good and see you. Um, see you next time. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thanks for listening today. Uh, when you need real estate, think about hashtag climate change. This guy said it. Trust him. Don't trust me. 
Catch you next time on the Anatomy of an Entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs>